Good afternoon. Welcome to the Cato Institute. My name is Brink Lindsay. I'm Vice President for Research here at Cato. Uh, delighted that you can join us today for a book forum on a new book by uh, Arnold Kling and Nick Schultz entitled uh, From Poverty to Prosperity. We, uh, we tend to attract a, a highly intelligent and discerning crowd to our events here at Cato. So probably uh, many of you have already picked up on the fact that uh, uh, the gentleman on my right is not Zanny Minton Beddoes. Uh, although she was the person who was uh, publicized as the commenter today. <clears throat> uh, they don't call it the cold and flu season for nothing, and uh, alas, poor Zanny is observing the season right now with a nasty bug, uh, which incidentally uh, she apparently picked up in Davos while covering the World Economic Forum. Yet another case, I guess, of international economic contagion. Thank you. <laughs> uh, but we're delighted to have uh, Tim from the Kauffman Foundation come here and uh, share his thoughts about this book. Uh, we're here today to talk about an excellent book uh, with excellent timing, by which I mean it is a superb treatment of a timely topic, and the topic is growth. Uh, the number one question in Washington right now is what can be done to get our economy to start growing again? Uh, normally, growth is taken for granted in Washington. Uh, the normal game in Washington is uh, how to divide the pie, uh, not uh, how to make it bigger. Uh, but with the economy having suffered a deep slump, and with unemployment and underemployment now at punishing double-digit levels, uh, the urgent issue is how to get people back to work again. Now, because this is a cyclical downturn, there's lots of talk about temporary counter-cyclical uh, policies. We've already had a huge spending splurge last year, the so-called stimulus bill, and now there's a flurry of activity to enact a so-called jobs bill <clears throat> with more spending and various targeted temporary uh, tax incentives. Uh, much of this is wasteful foolishness, while some of it, uh, at least, uh, might do a little bit of good. Uh, but there's widespread recognition in any event that such counter-cyclical measures uh, don't really get to the root of the problem. Uh, because uh, given how we got to the current predicament, there's a lot of concern about deeper structural problems with the American economy. Uh, after all, our last two economic expansions uh, turned out to be uh, speculative bubbles, or at least degenerated into them. Uh, the tech-led boom of the 90s started off real enough uh, before floating off into fantasy land. Uh, but the housing-led uh, boom of the past decade now looks like it may have been uh, a good deal of flim flammery all along. So there's a growing sense uh, that we have to get past quick fixes and make sure that the policy conditions for real and durable growth are in place. And there's no better guide to what those conditions are than this new book, From Poverty to Prosperity. This is a book about the new economics of growth, or economics 2.0, as the authors call it. Uh, traditional economics, or economics 1.0, was predominantly occupied with the efficient allocation of resources under conditions of scarcity. Economics 2.0, uh, on the other hand, is concerned with the conditions for overcoming scarcity by creating new resources and wealth. Uh, this is a wonderful survey of the new economics of growth, and perhaps its biggest selling point, at least to this reader, uh, is its superb interviews uh, with many of the giants uh, of the new growth economics. Uh, the book is especially timely today because the message of the book is so completely counter to the prevailing way of thinking here in Washington right now. The good news is that politicians are paying attention to the problem of growth. The bad news is that too many of them are thinking about it all wrong. The dominant tendency is to conceive of the problem as identifying specific sources of future growth, the so-called industries of the future, and then showering them with subsidies. <clears throat> the flavor of the season when it comes to industries of the future is green. Green industries, green jobs are all the rage right now. Indeed, here's what President Obama said just yesterday in a meeting with Senate Democrats. Quote, I continue to believe, and I'm not alone in this, that the country that figures out most rapidly new forms of energy and can commercialize new ideas is going to lead the 21st century economy. I think this is our growth model. Uh, Arnold and Nick uh, make clear in their book that this top-down industrial policy approach uh, is a sucker's game. We don't have any idea what the industries of the future are, uh, and uh, certainly we don't have any idea which specific companies are going to lead those industries of the future. The real task, rather, is to create conditions in which completely unpredictable innovations uh, can occur and get adopted. And for more about how to get that done, I'm going to turn it over 
uh, to the authors and commenter. Uh, I'll introduce the authors one at a time. We start with uh, Nick Schultz, who will be leading off. Uh, Nick is editor-in-chief of American.com, which is the fine online publication of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, focusing on uh, business and economics uh, and public affairs. Um, Nick formerly uh, was uh, editor of uh, the excellent website TCS Daily. Before that, he was politics editor at uh, foxnews.com. And with that, I'm going to turn the uh, podium over to Nick Schultz. Uh, thank you, Brink. Uh, let me say at the outset, I'd like to thank the Cato Institute for uh, hosting this event. Uh, I had a good the good fortune several years ago, back a long time ago when I was a television producer, of uh, interviewing Milton Friedman a couple of times um, at his home in, in San Francisco. And I remember him, him saying very clearly and explicitly uh, during the course of one of our interviews that freedom is my highest value. And uh, freedom is, I don't know if it's my highest value, but it's certainly uh, up there uh, in the top tier. And uh, the Cato Institute has done more uh, to defend freedom in this town where it needs defending than just about anybody else, and we're very grateful for, for your work. Um, it's uh, needed now uh, as much as ever. Um, uh, I also want, it, it, it's an honor to be here with Brink uh, because I'm going to do my publisher no favors by breaking the first rule of promoting a book, which is immediately talk about somebody else's book. Uh, but Brink has written, there are a lot of young people in the room who may not be familiar with it. Brink has written what, in my view, is one of the 25 uh, or so best books of the last uh, quarter century, uh, a book called Against the Dead Hand. And if you've never read it or don't know it, please go get it. Uh, it's uh, had a profound influence on me, how I look at the, the world, how I look at geopolitics and economics. And uh, so it's, it's a real honor to be uh, with you. Um, uh, Brink mentioned that the original discussant couldn't be here, but uh, we do have Tim Kane, which is uh, terrific. Uh, Tim is at the Kauffman Foundation. We'll probably tell you a little bit more about them. But one of the things I found in doing the research for this book, uh, a big theme of the book is entrepreneurship and entrepreneur-led growth. Um, and there had been, until recently, very little uh, solid economic research that had been done on entrepreneurship. Now, there are a number of reasons for that, uh, which Tim might be able to get into. But the research that has been done, a lot of it is, uh, has been done thanks to support from the Kauffman Foundation. And, uh, uh, whether you realize it or not, we're very much in debt to that, to our enriched understanding of entrepreneurship and entrepreneur-led growth, uh, thanks to Tim and his team's uh, work at Kauffman. So it's great, great to have Tim here. Um, I want to talk about three things today. Um, uh, the first is my interest in this subject, which uh, is of a, a personal nature, which I'll, I'll talk about in a second. Second thing is who might be interested in this in this book, and then the third is uh, just a, a big takeaway that I'm I'm hoping to uh, leave you with today. Um, my interest in this topic of uh, long run uh, dynamic economic growth uh, actually starts with some of my family history. Um, I come from, as the name Schultz uh, suggests, I come from good German stock. Uh, German Lutheran immigrants who came to the United States in the 19th century, and they were cabinet makers. They were basically carpenters. Uh, they in, were engaged in a profession that it's not the oldest profession. I don't think any of my ancestors were doing that, but one of the oldest professions in recorded history. And they came to the United States, settled in Chicago, and they were cabinet makers. And when they were there, uh, they entered uh, in the 19th century century, the then uh, burgeoning piano-making business, uh, the M. Schultz and Company piano-making company of Chicago. Um, uh, they were entrepreneurs. Uh, it was, I won't go into the details of the piano, the history of the piano industry, but it's actually a pretty fascinating uh, uh, industrial history. Um, and uh, the, they had some success with that. They competed vigorously uh, with companies like Steinway of New York. Um, and they uh, ultimately lost out to Steinway and some others. Um, what they did is they adapted to the fact that they didn't compete as well. They entered a niche market, uh, adopting new technologies, and uh, they entered the, the player piano market. So the old, you've probably seen them, the old pianos with the rolls 
and the scrolls, uh, and they were very successful in, in doing that. They harnessed new technologies, they, adopt, they adapted to competitive pressure, they changed, they tried and experimented with new things, and they had some success in this market. Um, they, uh, uh, they were successful with that up to a point, and that point was competition from new forms of entertainment that came, uh, uh, that, that Americans and others could access in the middle part of the 20th century. So home forms of, uh, uh, of musical entertainment that, that sort of pushed the uh, player piano to the, to, into an earlier era. Um, so what were they to do with this? Well, they adapted again under this competitive pressure, seeing that this market was disappearing. And they uh, entered a new business uh, line of business where they created a product called the Auto Typist. This was based, based on existing technology of the player piano. And basically what it was is uh, a combination of sort of a typewriter and a Xerox machine. Um, you would, uh, it gave you, if you were an office manager, say you ran a law firm where you had to uh, produce a lot of paper, uh, you could type out a letter and then you had this imprint in the same way that a piano scroll had this imprint and then you could publish over and over and over again that same letter to send out to clients or whomever. So they entered an entirely new market uh, and they had enormous success with this for a while until uh, in the second half of the 20th century, new forms of technology and innovation started to put pressure on uh, the autotypist. Obviously, we had electric typewriters, we had actual Xerox machines, we had the personal computer revolution, and then the internet uh, uh, to today. And the autotypist is now sitting in some uh, industrial history museum somewhere. Um, but even my father's uh, generation, my, a couple of my uncles worked for the company up into the 70s. That's how long that this thing stuck around. So uh, that brings me to my own career, which has been uh, spent, as Brink indicated, a lot of time I've spent in web publishing. Now, these were jobs that literally did not exist 15 years ago, and yet I've been gainfully employed working uh, with technology and in uh, sectors that, that simply didn't exist. And yet, these were the same forces that enabled me to have my career today were those that upset and destroyed my earlier ancestors' uh, businesses and lines of work and livelihoods. Um, the, uh, um, now, the, that's a little bit about my, my family history. I tell you that because as I looked at that, when I looked at sort of standard economic uh, uh, descriptions, uh, it, they were unable to capture this dynamic process of change over time. And they overlooked a number of different things. I mean, you have the standard economic model, which takes land, labor, and capital as factors of production. And then uh, there's a discussion about how to allocate scarce resources, as, as Brink mentioned. But this overlooks so many uh, uh, factors, including things like entrepreneurship, uh, competition, the entry and exit of firms, um, uh, innovation and technical change, uh, the knowledge base that grows over time that makes uh, continuing technical change possible, um, uh, and also the institutional mix of, of laws and norms um, and conventions that make uh, dynamic economic change possible over time. All this has been largely absent from a sustained discussion of uh, economics up until very recently. And so as I looked at this family history, I said, well, how can I understand this better? Uh, but as it turns out, there has been a lot of work over the last two generations in economics that's trying to help answer some of that. It's trying to help explain this dynamic process over time. Um, Arnold's going to talk a little bit more about some of the, some of what's in the in the book, uh, but that explains my interest. Now, who uh, I'd like to turn to who would be um, uh, interested in this book? Uh, as Brink said, there are a number of interviews with fairly prominent thinkers that will be known to many of the people in this room, um, uh, folks like Robert Fogel or Paul Romer. Um, uh, and people like that, but uh, there, there are also interviews with, with, with people that may not be as well known to you or whose work you may not be as familiar with, so I encourage you to, um, uh, so I encourage you to, to, to spend some time with it. Uh, but I also think this is a book that should appeal to, it, it's, it's not a partisan book. Uh, we, we I, I used to joke that we probably could have had 
better book sales if we named it From Poverty to Prosperity and How Obama's Taking Us Back to Poverty Again or something like that. But it's, it's, a, it's an explicitly nonpartisan book. Uh, it's an idea book, and it should appeal to uh, honest people of any sort of ideological or political stripe. I actually think in some ways it is a, designed to be a conversation with liberals. Um, uh, Arnold once described himself in, a, in an essay a number of years ago as a bleeding heart libertarian, and I sort of think of myself in a, in a similar manner. And so what we're presenting in the book uh, should, I think, be appealing to, to liberals. Now, I know this is a, a, an issue of uh, concern to Brink, who has been trying to engage in a dialogue between libertarians and liberals to see if there's common ground and maybe um, progressives could be uh, attracted to some of the arguments that libertarians make about markets and uh, about why we should rely on markets more than, than state action, say. Um, this book might be a little bit of a litmus test for that thesis. Uh, if, if honest liberals want to give it a, a shot, I think there's a lot that they will find in it uh, that should appeal to them. A uh, number of the people that we interview are, are political liberals. So um, uh, we'll, we'll see if the, the uh, the, the love of sort of technocratic uh, management can be overcome by the arguments that are presented in, in some of these books, and we'll see. Um, and then uh, just, just a couple of takeaway uh, thoughts. One of, the, one of the major themes of the book it has to do with how we understand markets and how we understand what markets do. Um, this will be a little bit of a, uh, uh, of a gross generalization, but, but in the main, when we have a political discussion uh, about markets, we things sort of break down to two camps. We have one camp that says, well, markets work. They deliver all these, these goods, uh, and they work, so therefore we should rely on markets. Uh, then this other camp uh, looks at what markets do, and in the context, obviously, of the recent financial uh, mess and the economic downturn, they say, well, look, markets don't work. And that's why we need to have government come in and manage, tweak markets so that they work for everybody. Well, one of the messages of this uh, book is that markets fail, but that's why we need markets. Uh, what we're advocating is that people take uh, a look at what markets do over time, which is enable space for trial and error and experimentation and searching, which are the only ways reliably over time to have long-run economic growth, technological advance, uh, and beneficial uh, wealth creation and, and social change. Um, but it ha that has to be understood in the context of the fact that markets will fail. People, entrepreneurs will experiment with things that won't work. Uh, sometimes there will be uh, entrepreneurial enthusiasm to the point of a bubble, as we saw with the uh, technology bubble in the late 90s and early 2000s. Uh, my sense is there's very little that can be done uh, by technocrats in advance to manage that um, lawful chaos in a way that doesn't end up uh, throwing out the baby with the bathwater. So uh, uh, again, we, we're advocating a very sort of realistic assessment of markets, uh, but one that, because it acknowledges that markets indeed do fail, uh, should appeal to those who, for whom, uh, as a political posture, that's their starting point when they advocate government involvement in the economy. We say that conclusion doesn't necessarily follow, and you'll have to read the, the book to, uh, to understand that. Um, one final note, uh, the, the, the role played by the entrepreneur in economic change over time is one that has not, at least until recently, I think, been sufficiently appreciated. It's still underappreciated. Um, and uh, I mentioned Tim's uh, uh, Kauffman Foundation has done good work on trying to help us understand what it is that entrepreneurs do, how entrepreneurial activity arises uh, and shapes economies over time. Uh, a big theme of the book is that what entrepreneurs principally do is overcome resistance to change. And that resistance can come in many forms. It can come in the form of incumbent firms that are threatened by uh, a new entrant uh, or by a technology who want to use the political process to stop. Uh, uh, that, that entrepreneurial change from happening. Um, and that gets me to one of the worries that, uh, that, that Brink actually highlighted, which is uh, that we may have, one thing I worry about is a sort of distortion of entrepreneurship that happens when the political class 
settles on a few uh, select areas that they think are economic or technological winners. Uh, Brink mentioned green technology, and I think that's right. We may, me, uh, Arnold and I did a piece recently uh, saying that we may be uh, at the beginning stages of a green bubble, a uh, green technology bubble that's pumped up by policymakers in the same way that we had a housing bubble that was pumped up in part by policymakers, not, not in total, and there were market forces at work here, but policy definitely had a role in the housing bubble, and it may well if we end up with a green technology bubble. Um, but what worries me is that the moment that uh, governments get in this business of picking winner technologies, uh, it makes the genuine entrepreneur's job of overcoming resistance that much harder. Because you're not only having to overcome incumbent industries, uh, technological lock-in, people not wanting to change their routines and what they're doing, but you have a very powerful interest that has made a bet in a certain direction and will be not inclined to lose that bet. Uh, if anything, will be inclined to double down over time. So one challenge is looking, uh, taking a very sort of realistic uh, look at entrepreneurship, uh, how it actually works in the economy, and what the, the challenges and threats are which come in the form of government-run entrepreneurship or government-led entrepreneurship. And uh, so with that, I will uh, sit down and let Arnold talk, and I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> Next speaker is co-author Arnold Kling, uh, who is an independent scholar and uh, an adjunct scholar uh, here at Cato. Uh, <clears throat> he was uh, once upon a time on, an economist on the staff of uh, the Federal Reserve System, uh, also a senior economist at uh, Freddie Mac, uh, where uh, he got an eyeful of uh, mischief that later was to explode in all of our faces. Um, he's also an entrepreneur uh, who started uh, HomeFair.com, one of the first uh, commercial sites on the web. Uh, he's the author of several books, including uh, a Cato book, uh, Crisis of Abundance, Rethinking How We Pay for Healthcare, and also uh, in a strange uh, quirk of <clears throat> publishing, uh, another book besides From Poverty to Prosperity that came out just recently uh, called Unchecked and Unbalanced about the uh, worrying conflict between two trends, the growing dispersion of knowledge and the growing concentration of power, and how those two trends don't go together very well. But now he's here to talk about From Poverty to Prosperity. Everybody, please welcome Arnold Kling. All right, thanks. Uh, I want to congratulate Brink on uh, scheduling this event for February 4th, not February 5th, where another snowstorm is supposed to come in. Um, my understanding is that because the, uh, this, these snowstorms have, been, have dominated the news recently, that uh, President Obama is planning a major address on the topic. Uh, the, uh, my sources tell me that his advisors are telling him not to try to convince people that it's due to global warming, uh, but instead they'll blame the Bush administration's deregulation of the weather, um, you know, the, this, this mess that we inherited. Anyway, um, uh, this, when Nick and I were writing this book, we went through a number of working titles, and one of the working titles was Economics 2.0. The thinking there is that the ideas in this book are uh, very different from what's in the standard economics curriculum, but they're at least as important. And I should emphasize that these are not ideas that are original with Nick and me. On the contrary, they are ideas that we assembled and packaged uh, out of th I, research that has uh, taken place for the most part of the last 50 years, although you can see antecedents to these ideas before that. Um, and I want to just make three uh, talk about three of the differences between economics 2.0 and what we call economics 1.0. Uh, the first difference is the questions that we ask. We ask, uh, how did countries like ours grow to be so rich, and why are some countries still so poor? And we spend uh, basically 350 pages preoccupied with those questions, and yet if you pick up a standard economics textbook, you might not find three and a half pages dedicated to those questions. So that's one difference. Um, another difference is that, and this is in the subtitle of the book, we focus on intangible factors 
Um, we focus on the asset side uh, of the economy. We focus on ideas, entrepreneurship, innovation. And on the liability side, we focus on things that hold countries back, which include uh, predatory government and cultural resistance to change and cultural resistance to learning. Uh, so those are all intangible factors as opposed to the traditional tangible fa sources of wealth of land, labor, and capital. And the third difference, which I'll talk about uh, in a few minutes, is, uh, but which Nick alluded to a little bit, is the, a different way of looking at market effectiveness versus market failure. Okay, so uh, on this difference of, you know, how countries became rich and why countries remain poor, hence the actual title of this book, From Poverty to Prosperity, comparing the poverty of some countries with the prosperity of others, or how we emerged out of what we would now consider poverty 200 years ago uh, to the prosperity that we have today. So that's the first question. And that question, um, or that, those questions, in a way, have been in the news a lot recently because of the aftermath of the earthquake in Haiti. And that really dramatizes how poor a country that is and, and what that means. And, and people can ask, you know, how, how does a country remain that poor? And we don't have a specific discussion of Haiti in the book, but we do discuss poor countries in general. And uh, based on that, I think I can safely make uh, three remarks about the situation in Haiti. First of all, um, poor countries, again, tend to suffer from government that's predatory, and of course you had the Duvalier regime in Haiti, and a cultural resistance to learning. Uh, th those tend to be uh, syndromes in poor countries. Um, and the uh, most research in the last 50 years stresses the role of property rights and the ability of ordinary citizens to establish and maintain control over businesses and over property uh, in order for there to be wealth creation. So one of the interesting findings that uh, we mentioned in the book is that in poor countries, it tends to take months or even years to get a business license, whereas we're used in rich countries, we're used to that being a process of days or at most a couple weeks. Uh, so that's just an, an indication of sort of the institutional failures that are often at work in poor countries. Um, second observation I'd make about Haiti uh, is that in spite of the fact that we would, we think that there are governance issues and cultural issues involved in poverty, in you know, countries being poor, uh, we would not suggest going in and trying to govern the country ourselves or to change the culture from the top down. Uh, you know, cultural institutions and government institutions are deeply embedded, and they, they always function to some extent. Uh, so even in this desperate relief situation, uh, probably the more successful aid programs are working with local institutions and local culture rather than trying to work against them. And the third observation I'd make is that you know, we, we notice a number of countries in which side by side you have one country where the productivity level of workers is very low and another, in a neighboring country productivity is very high. And in those situations, we've observed a faster increase in productivity for the low productivity workers if they move to the high productivity country than if they wait for the institutions of the high productivity country to take root in, in their country. So that would suggest perhaps that we ought to be relatively lenient in terms of allowing refugees or immigration from Haiti. All right, let me switch gears then to talk about this issue of how we think about market effectiveness and market failure. The standard Economics 1.0 uh, approach is what we call static efficiency. And we instead take the approach that Douglas North calls adaptive efficiency. So static efficiency takes the state of knowledge as given and says, how well does the market do at allocating resources efficiently? And if it allocates them optimally, then it's 
statically efficient, and if, it, if it's unlikely to allocate them optimally, then it's not. And from that perspective, it's very unlikely that markets are going to be efficient because the conditions that are required are much too stringent. When you take a freshman course, you hear that about the problem that externalities can cause. You know, things like pollution can mess up market allocations. But there are other things that are, uh, that are even more prevalent, other issues. There are information gaps where people, uh, consumers don't necessarily understand everything about what they're buying. Those cause problems. There are differentiated products which means that you can't have the kind of perfect competition that supposedly is needed for static efficiency. And then you have um, upfront costs or fixed costs, which make it, again, make it impossible to have enough competition that you'll have perfect sta uh, static efficiency. So just last week, uh, Apple announced a product called the iPad. And that illustrates kind of all these problems. First of all, information gaps. Uh, it's very hard to figure out what it does, what it should do, uh, how, or, or how well it works. I think most of the early people who buy it will buy it not knowing exactly how, how well it's going to work or whether it's going to do anything useful for them. Um, it's clearly a differentiated product. It's not a commodity. And a lot of the costs involved were upfront development costs and research, and that's why you know, other entrants are not going to be able to come up with a similar product very quickly. So that's sort of a classic example of a modern uh, you know, economic product or service that clearly is not going to satisfy the conditions for static efficiency. So if you're inclined to evaluate markets in terms of static efficiency, you're going to think that just about everywhere there are opportunities for government to step in and allocate resources more effectively. Instead, we look at adaptive efficiency. We don't say, How's the market working today? We say, over time, how, how is the market improving? Are, how effective is it at incorporating better, cheaper products and services over time? And that, so that's a question of dynamic efficiency. Let, let me illustrate that with uh, sort of what's happened since the World Wide Web was introduced about 15 years ago. Um, in the stock brokerage industry, there's been a great deal of disruption with a lot of newer, cheaper, and better services introduced in stock brokerage. So that would be an indication of a dynamically effective market, an adaptively effective market. Uh, real estate brokerage, on the other hand, has hardly changed at all. In fact, if you'd asked me 15 years ago, I would have been shocked if you would have told me that today we would still see real estate agents sitting in houses collecting standard commissions. So that industry has not been disrupted, which suggests perhaps an adaptive market failure. Um, another contrast would be music publishing versus academic publishing. The music publishing industry has been disrupted quite a bit. Uh, we have very different models now, iTunes and so on. And my guess is that we're going to see even more disruption in music publishing, which suggests that there's a reasonable amount of adaptive efficiency in that market. Now, by that, I don't necessarily mean that the incumbents have adapted, but the overall market uh, has produced adaptive efficiency. In academic publishing, on the other hand, uh, there's been very little change, which is sort of ironic since Tim Berners-Lee uh, founded the World Wide Web not to create a platform for Facebook or Amazon, but as a platform for academic communication. And yet, academic journals still look pretty much the way they did 15 years ago, which again indicates to me sort of an adaptive market failure. So adaptive market efficiency means that uh, upstarts can come in, try new products and services, have the inferior efforts be weeded out, but have the successful efforts, the better, cheaper products, uh, work their way into the market and force incumbents either to adapt or to go out of business. So that's what, uh, what we mean by adaptive efficiency. And that's our, our criterion for looking at market effectiveness versus market failure. And the concern, as Nick mentioned, is that, that government is going to tend to uh, side with the incumbents. Incumbents are politically salient, upstarts are not. So whereas the static efficiency criterion says if you 
if you everywhere you look, you see opportunities for government to make things better. Uh, when we look at adaptive efficiency, everywhere you look, we see government as a threat to make things worse by protecting incumbents and holding back upstarts. So those are the uh, again the three. The three differences I wanted to highlight today between Economics 2.0 and Economics 1.0. First, we asked the question about From Poverty to Prosperity, the title of the book. You know, what, what make, how did we get to be so rich as a country, and yet how do other countries remain so poor? We focus on intangible factors, the um, ideas, innovation, and entrepreneurship on the plus side, uh, predatory government, and cultural resistance to learning on the minus side. And finally, we have a different way of looking at market effectiveness and uh, versus market failure. And uh, again, I think those ideas are very important. I believe that uh, they belong in the standard economics curriculum. I think that they ought to be incorporated by, in uh, business and financial journalism and economic journalism. And I hope that someday they become part of the overall public consciousness. Thanks. Thanks, Arnold. Our commenter today is Tim Kane, who is a senior fellow at the Kaufman Foundation. Um, he's also the uh, co-creator and co-author of the economics blog growthology.org, uh, which is well worth your time. Uh, and that reminds me, I forgot to mention, uh, uh, amongst uh, Arnold's uh, writing projects, he is the uh, co-author, uh, co-editor of uh, a f an another fine economics blog, Econ Talk, which you should all check out and read regularly. Um, uh, when uh, Tim uh, was uh, was also in uh, before uh, being at Kaufman, uh, editor, uh, lead editor, and author of the 2007 uh, Index of Economic Freedom, uh, co-published by the Wall Street Journal and uh, the Heritage Foundation. Uh, Tim is also a successful entrepreneur, having founded uh, uh, multiple software firms, uh, uh, and in addition was a veteran Air Force officer. So he's been on the upstart side and in uh, Leviathan as well. So uh, with that uh, comprehensive perspective, please welcome Tim Kane. Thanks, Tim. When, when I was in the Air Force, I remember people used to talk about Big Blue as an example of a, of a bureaucratic organization that was slow moving, and I thought they meant the Air Force, and I was like, you're absolutely right. Um, but it has been an interesting perspective. Um, th this book is fantastic. Let me start with that. I, I, I've known um, the two authors for, for a while, uh, but I was blown away, and I've been involved in the policy debates like folks here at Cato have. <laughs> Uh, and I, I'd, I'd like to say also I'm remiss in thanking Cato for having me here and hosting this event. Cato has really carried the torch, I think, for liberty here in Washington, D.C. for a long time, and uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. If I were to point to one thing for someone to think about or read to push forward the idea of human progress, that it's happened, that it's been successful, it would be Chapter 2 of the book that we're talking about today. It's really a tour de force. And in fact, they have a series of charts and numbers um, from A to Z. Actually, it's from A to AB because you guys ran out of 26 points to make. They had 27 points to make. Each of them is impressive from the acceleration of growth rates over time um, to food intake, uh, calories. I mean, just, just a fantastic series of charts that I would highly recommend. And in fact, if I were teaching economics, I would have that chapter be part of reading for whatever course I was teaching, whether it was macro, micro, intro, graduate growth. Everyone can learn a lot from that. So here's the important thing to understand. You can disagree with everything they write and everything they opine and all of the fantastic economists that are interviewed in this book and their theories, but you can't disagree with the facts that they lay out in charts A to chart AB. Um, it's, it's really astounding when you think about not just that growth has happened and it's had this impact on our lives. And Arnold pointed out um, the new Apple tablet as, as sort of a, a paradigm of thinking how government might get involved. So I have with me, turned off, um, an iPhone. And I've never had uh, techno lust like I have for this. It's a fantastic device. And I remember when I didn't have one for a while, I hate to adopt things too early, but I, I knew I was going to get this. And I remember 20 years ago when 
I was at the Air Force Academy. We were the first class to have computers, right? So this is a blast from the past, but you can imagine going through basic training, right? And you're the first class with, with computers and the class above you didn't get them. So they're thinking, all right, we're the, we're the Neanderthal macho guys and we're just gonna take it out on you guys during basic training because you're a bunch of rotor-headed geeks. That's what we went through that summer. But nobody imagined that you were gonna carry around something that had more power than that computer on our desktop in their pocket. And this book challenged you to think not just the world we live in now and how wonderful it is and that human progress is a reality, but that 20 years forward, what will this technology look like or what will have been incorporated? Because if, if, if Tim Kaine of 2010 were to talk to Tim Kaine of 1990 and say, not only will you have a computer in your pocket, but you'll be able to have a mapping program in it. Um, you'll, you'll be able to talk instantaneously on this phone slash computer to someone in Japan. I mean, that, that's just a profound change in the way that we live. And to think what it will be like in 20 years, understand those forces, you can draw a lot of that out of this book. That's certainly what I got out of it. Here's what I think is still missing, and I want to challenge the authors to address in Q&A. Um, let me back up and say, at the Kauffman Foundation, I started this blog called Growthology, and I actually was mentored by, by the two authors who have blogs of their own. And I realized um, there are these amazing individual opinions, these economic bloggers, and no one's tried to collect them all together and survey them and get a consensus, sort of do a, a, a Wikinomics or crowdsourcing of that set of opinions. So just this week, we launched a survey of leading economics bloggers. And one of the questions in there, that, that these were all questions that the bloggers themselves came up with, one of the questions that I wanted to ask was, uh, if you could come up with a growth model for busy policymakers, what would it look like? What are the three things it would include? And I originally phrased the question as, if you could come up with a growth model that even a congressman can understand, uh, <laughs> but my editor said that was a little bit rough, so we changed it. <laughs> busy policymaker. Um, because there's a model for the other side, for the static side, and that model is, I think even Keynes would cringe, the Keynesian model, which says Y equals C plus I plus G plus NX, right? And it's very easy. When C goes down, when, when aggregate consumption goes down, you can just inflate G. Even though you talk to you know, bright Democrats, bright Republicans, they all understand that that doesn't describe the world we live in. Um, we're still stuck with it. That's still the, the fallback mentality is, if the stimulus bill that was passed by Bush wasn't big enough, let's make a bigger one for Obama. And if that one didn't work well enough, let's just double the size and try it again. Why don't we have a competing growth model? And this is the question I wanted to get at. What are those three variables that you would include? And I have to say I was disappointed with the results I got back. I think the three things that were highest were human capital, which is fantastic, innovation, again, great to see that included, and economic freedom. And as the former editor of the Index of Economic Freedom, I thought that was all right, too. But I put in the word scale, and I, I, I think if I could get every congressman to understand the idea that if we can increase the scale of our economy, that's where we get specialization, that's where we get a lot of innovation from, um, and it, it was the lowest choice of all. So I wanted to challenge you guys on that. Is, that. is that the right model? Is that the right even approach that we should have, a very simplified model? doesn't describe everything. But I think it does fall in line with what they came up with. One of their core ideas being there's the hardware view of the world, which is sort of the classic model of output equals a combination of physical capital, physical labor, physical land. And the, the new model, which we implicitly understand, is software. They describe as software. Um, David Brooks, when he reviewed this book in the New York Times very favorably, called it the protocol economy. Uh, Michael Mandel likes to call it innovation economics. So a lot of people get this. But we know, it, we know it's a software thing. But how can we put it in a in a simple equation that even a busy policymaker can understand. That's sort of a, a conversation I'd like to have with you all. Um, the other thing is I want to point out, I saw a number of authors in this book not just talk about growth, but about the acceleration of growth. And in fact, one of the authors not included, but who's, who's worth following is Brad DeLong, who's cited in the book, though. So he's not interviewed, but he, he's cited. And in fact, DeLong pointed out the, the, some benchmarks of how 
income per capita has risen over time. And I remember, haven't published this anywhere, but if you imagine that the growth rate hasn't just been a flat sort of 2% per year, but then it's actually been accelerating since, say, 1800, that boils down to about adding 0.1 percentage point of growth to your overall growth rate every decade. So that, say, in another 70 years, we'll be at 3% a year, decade after that, 3.1. What are the implications for that? The implications are, unfortunately, to some, that we're not going to have a world where the development gap that's discussed between, say, Haiti and the United States is, is filled in, that the poor countries won't converge. That was actually something I've been looking at since my dissertation in economics. I, I thought I would be able to find evidence that there was indirect convergence over the long term. And instead, what you see is the wealthy country, especially the lead economy, diverging, getting wealthier and wealthier and wealthier. And you look at places like Haiti, and they're stagnant. So I, I normally agree with almost everything here, Brink, but this is sort of my fun way to try to think of a way I could disagree or, or stir up the pot. Um, I, let's talk about Haiti. Is, is Arnold's second point right that we, we really can't do much but be a beacon of light and show them how liberty works here in this country, uh, and, and then hopefully they'll follow? Because it seems to me they're in some sort of a trap. And I would agree that you know sending in the Marines and taking over the country whole hog, imperialism circa 1800, is not going to work. But isn't there some middle ground that we, could, that we could find? And doesn't maybe even Paul Romer suggest this with, with some of his thinking? So that's a conversation to have about those countries catching up. The second challenge is, is the US really going to be that lead economy 100 years from now that's diverging away? I'd like to think so. But a few of the writers uh, talk about China, and that China seems to maybe have a better sense of economics 2.0 than we do here in Washington, DC. So again, fantastic book, highly recommended. As much as I love all the interviews, I can't, again, overemphasize how much I enjoyed chapter two. Thank you. We'll uh, open it up to Q&A, but first I just wondered if uh, either Arnold or Nick wanted to respond at all to, uh, to uh, the challenges that uh, the Tim raised. Uh, first, just about uh, the poverty trap, uh, and, uh, and is that real, uh, and, uh, and is there any way that uh, in your research or your survey of research that uh, looks like a, a, a generally promising exit strategy from a po uh, poverty trap? Uh, and then secondly, uh, just uh, handicapping, uh, uh, looking forward, whether, uh, whether the U.S. is uh, going to maintain its <clears throat> position as a leading innovative economy or whether it's uh, falling off the pace. Well, the, f the first words out of my mouth when you ask, you know, what are the, you, uh, Tim's first issue of, you know, what model would you give to policymakers? Uh, the first words out of my mouth are trial and error. Um, that's, I think, been a theme of my thinking for a long time, so you have to be careful. I may be very biased about it. I wrote it about it in every book that I've written, including Crisis of Abundance, saying that, uh, you know, we, we need trial and error solutions in healthcare. Um, and I think that would be my solution in the poverty trap, that there's trial and error starting from the situations where they are. I'm tempted to just outsource my views on Haiti to uh, Bill Easterly, who is one of the people we interviewed in the book, and who has a blog called aidwatch.org, A-I-D-watch.org. Uh, and he, you know, I guess my views are just so similar to his, and his are have so much well more well-informed than mine that I would just take take his views, but I think, you know, trial and error, he uses the term searchers rather than planners, that local people searching, trying out things uh, rather than, than, than coming up with a grand plan that will get your way out of poverty. Um, for the future, I think we speculate a little bit. I, I, my view of the future is informed a bit what I, by what I call Kurzweilnomics, uh, you know, Ray Kurzweil's view of the uh, you know, ever accelerating change led by Moore's law. I think there's there's room for some skepticism there, but I uh, and I am actually skeptical of, about a lot of Kurzweil's view. But I think the potential for ever accelerating growth is there. Uh, one of the people that we interview in our book, Amar Bidet, would I think 
I don't know, I may could be mangling his name actually, but uh, I think he um, he would dismiss any concern that China will displace us because uh, if China does come up with new inventions, his analytical framework would suggest that we will adopt them much more quickly. He talks about the role of venturesome consumers in producing growth, that it's, you shouldn't just think of the lone heroic entrepreneur, Steve Jobs, as being the promoter of growth. It's the fact that there's so many fools out here who are willing to try anything Steve Jobs puts out uh, and try to make something useful out of it that, in fact, uh, m make us a, uh, a faster-growing country. And from that point of view, uh, any innovation that comes from China is not a threat but an opportunity. Uh, yeah, just a couple of, uh, to reinforce a couple of those points. Yeah, if there's a model, uh, it's trial and error. And I'd, I'd extend that to point out, um, uh, for, if you want to introduce this to a policymaker or a congressman and explain trial and error, it, it, you also have to couple that with a realistic uh, assessment of how politics actually works. And the reason that, again, political interference is so problematic because, uh, and it has to do with the error side of trial and error, there, the, the political tolerance for error is so low uh, from government failure that what you have is when you have uh, uh, government failure in the policy arena, you have um, either a temptation among policymakers to uh, point their finger at something else that must be the problem or to say, like with the case of the stimulus, well, we didn't do enough, uh, so we need to do more of the same, and let's double down our bets on that. Um, one of the, uh, uh, th th you need to contrast that with how markets actually work, trial and error markets work, where error uh, is punished. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, new firms can come in and advance uh, technologies or products that work, and those that don't can't, uh, and they don't get support, and that's how progress uh, uh, continues over time. Um, whether or not you can get a, a policymaker to adopt the trial and error model, uh, which means basically letting the market work, uh, failures and warts and all, is an open question because it's not really in the DNA of politicians who want to try to start uh, monkeying with things. Um, uh, on this point about what can we do uh, to close the, the development gap, um, Paul Romer, who we interviewed in the book, has this really interesting idea for charter cities, which some of you may know about, where he basically looks at, at the success that China has had, where uh, China has had success in the coastal regions and elsewhere, where there were basically uh, uh, areas where they changed the institutional mix of laws uh, in permitting uh, market activity, and you've had enormous uh, growth there. So if you can adopt this model, say in Haiti, if you could turn Port-au-Prince into a charter city where you change the institutional makeup there, there might be hope for uh, real rapid change. Now, uh, he also says, and I think he's probably right about this, you can't uh, you need to be invited in to do this, and I think what he's trying to do is set up a, an architecture where he or people like Hernando de Soto or others, uh, Brink Lindsay, could be brought in and try to help you um, set up an institutional mix that will work with your cultural norms uh, that already exist. Um, and so there, there might be some hope there. So I'm not totally uh, pessimistic about, about the future. Otherwise, uh, you know, more immigration, uh, which I know is not politically um, uh, pleasant for a lot of people, but uh, certainly in the case of Haiti with refugees, we should bring, be bringing as many as we can here. Uh, and the final point about, about China, I'm actually, uh, there are some people we interview in the book who are, who are very bullish about China. Um, uh, and I have, I, I think, sort of, uh, I'm, I'm a little agnostic on it. Um, uh, I would say that what you've seen with the dust up with Google and other things recently suggests that uh, China's place at the technological frontier is going to be limited. Um, they're happy permitting free, uh, free enterprise in areas that don't really challenge state control, but in uh, frontier technologies of information technology and communications that threaten the, the regime there, uh, they don't like it. And you know what? Innovators aren't going to go and work there for a long period of time or really innovate there. 
they'll go to other countries where they can. They'll come to the United States, they'll go to India, uh, they'll go to other places in Asia. So it's an open question about how quickly China opens and really embraces uh, the technological frontier. And then this last point Arnold mentioned about ventures and consumers, which the, the demand side of, for innovation and technological change uh, is a totally overlooked aspect of uh, the discourse on this. We have the heroic entrepreneur who creates something, that's the end of the story. Well, no, it's not. You have to have a culture where you have consumers who are habituated to <laughs> trying things out. And that's very much the case here in the United States. Um, people will run out and buy the iPad, even if they have no idea what it's going to do. And maybe it'll be a bust. You know, Steve Jobs has had a number of busts, uh, uh, the iPad cube or whatever it was and a number of other he's had a lot of failures but uh, he 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 operates in a market that's very open to taking risks and trying even on the consumer side and that leads me to think that the United States is actually pretty well positioned you know for the next 50 or 100 years let me just add my own uh, two cents I, I I'm all for uh, the spirit behind your trial and error uh, mantra but uh, it needs something more than that uh, because I think Washington's got trial and error down pat uh, <laughs> particularly the error part. Uh, the, the problem is the feedback loops connected to the, uh, uh, to the trial and error process. Uh, in the market, we have uh, good ideas leading to profits, leading to imitation, and bad ideas leading to losses, leading to dropping bad ideas. And uh, we have rather the opposite dynamic often in Washington, uh, where bad ideas attract more money. Um, with that, uh, let's open it up to questions. Uh, please uh, give your name and uh, make it a question and make it a quick question so we can fit in lots. Uh, right here. Uh, a microphone will be coming to you. Uh, I can't help but take the opportunity to say, when you say uh, we got to study how politics works, I think we, you meant how politics, we have to learn how politics doesn't work. But in, anyway, that's just my quip. My question is, uh, how are you different than uh, than what the Austrians are saying. I mean, certainly they have always been emphasizing entrepreneurship and the fact that, you know, you there's countless intangible factors to consider and, and analysis. I, how, how would you say what you're saying differs from uh, what the Austrian economists say? Um, I, I wouldn't... I'd be willing to plead guilty to uh, there being a, a big Austrian antecedent to what we write. I think uh, it's just informed by some more recent research that uh, tends to support that point of view, but you can see plenty of Hayek and Schumpeter in, in what we write. Gentleman on the aisle. Dan Lieberman. Uh, pundits have speculated that uh, just to accommodate uh, population growth, the U.S. economy will have to grow 3% of the year, which means after 24 years, the GDP will double from $14 trillion to $28 trillion, which is probably bigger than the combined economies of the world today. So it seemed that for a very short time, we will go from scarcity to depletion. We will probably use up all the resources of the world in a very short time. So should we be talking about growth or should we be talking about fundamental changes to an economy which needs to be stabilized and needs to be preventing from total failure? Um, so w will we have depletion of resources? The, let me give you what I, th I think would be a Paul Romer type answer. Uh, Paul Romer said, gee, in, in, in physics we learn about the law of conservation of matter. We don't learn that matter gets depleted. Uh, so what, what economic activity consists of is taking, or if, to the extent that it's physical activity at all, and of course a lot of it is, is becoming, again, intangible activity, communications and so on. But to the extent that it's physical activity, it's taking some molecules and transforming them to other molecules. Uh, so it does, you know, in that sense, it, there is no depletion. We're coming up with new recipes for transforming molecules. So I think if you were to read the interview uh, with Paul Romer in our book, you'd get a, a perspective that says that uh, we really don't face an issue of depletion of resources, that that's really not the way the economy works. And, you know, the, and I think s some of the facts that we 
mentioned in the book include the, the fact that, like, for instance, the the weight per dollar of GDP is, is falling. So the physical components of GDP are falling relative to the mental components. Yeah, I'd also add, I mean, that that's a... Uh, uh, there, there's a long history of, of worrying about that exact question, limits to growth, and uh, uh, none of the predictions seem to bear out uh, in dynamic economies um, and free economies. So I think as long as the uh, uh, the economy remains relatively open and free, that's not something that I'm particularly worried about. <coughs> Hi, uh, Jim Manzi, um, Manhattan Institute, and uh, uh, former entrepreneur. Um, so I have a, a lot of questions. I'll just try and ask two quick ones. Uh, one is, do you think that um, uncertainty in the sense of Frank Knight, unquantifiable uncertainty, is inherent to entrepreneurial behavior and innovation, and therefore we will never have a, a mathematical understanding of its structure? Uh, or do you think it's plausible that we'll get there? Um, and second, if you take trial and error, uh, and say, as you did, that, gee, p part of that is letting failures fail. Um, I think that will cr that creates in natural conflicts in that the losers in the process have a understandable material interest in slowing down innovation. And do you agree that that creates an internal inherent tension in democratic capitalism? And if you, if you do, mm -hmm. do you have a point of view about how to deal with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, okay, so the first question, uh, you know, is it, does Knightian uncertainty make it uh, essentially impossible to come up with a mathematical model of entrepreneurship? I, th I think that's right. I think, uh, again, I'll advertise uh, one of the people that we talk with in the book, Joel Mokir, uh, talks about exactly that, that innovation, that economic growth is unpredictable precisely because of that, because, you, you know, no one knows which innovations are going to work or where they're going to come from. So there's this, this, this element of unpredictability to economic growth that's just inherent in that. And I, I'm, I'm in that camp. Um, so the next question is sort of uh, innovation creates losers as well as winners, and what kind of cr political dynamic does that create in, a, uh, in our society? Well, I mean, we see the type of dynamic it creates. It creates a dynamic where the government takes over General Motors uh, because, mm -hmm. you know, it can't think of a... Of, you know, it can't conceive of General Motors going out of business. Um, and then you ask, well, what to do about that? Um, and I think, uh, I, I guess I, I, I would try to come up with better ideas than taking over General Motors. Um, I don't think the standard mantra of retraining workers really works. I think the way employment dynamics work in this country is that Old workers retire early sometimes when their industries decline, and young workers come in with new skills. Um, so uh, I think, I guess I don't have a great answer for that. I, I think there's certainly a case for trying to develop a, uh, a sound and compassionate safety net that uh, that is that is more oriented toward being a safety net than toward being this kind of political mishmash, the accidental welfare state that we've kind of developed. Um, but I think that's that's difficult politically. But I think my my political solutions probably come in more in the other book. Uh, <laughs> Uh, where I have have wilder ideas about competitive government, and you know, I just just a, a, a brief point. There's nothing. I don't think there there are scale economies in government that justify a 300 million person polity. You know, if if, if you need if you needed to have so many things decided for 300 million people out of Washington D.C then Switzerland could not possibly work. Denmark could not possibly work. Singapore could not possibly work. The fact that those much smaller polities have decent welfare states and decent governments suggests to me that we could 
have a much more competitive governmental system where a lot more of these, even welfare state functions, took place at much lower levels of government. Um, so, anyway, but that's that, that's into the other book. Yeah, um, uh, I agree with Arnold on uh, on nineteen uncertainty, and and your second question uh, is one that uh, for me. Uh, personally, in working on this book, I wrestled with the most and don't have, I would say, any sort of satisfactory uh, answer. It was a question that we asked a lot of the um, uh, uh, of the interviewees in the book. Uh, it's very clear to, that they don't have satisfactory answers in terms of some uh, closed set that you can say, well, here's what we can do, and this solves the problem of the creation of, of losers in a dynamic economy. Interestingly, uh, Ned Phelps, who's one of the, the economists that we interview in the book, has been thinking a lot about this question in the context of Rawlsian uh, political philosophy um, and is doing a lot of extremely interesting philosophical work uh, right now on this. And I think it's in part because he takes very seriously the wanting to maintain uh, the gains and advantages that we get from a dynamic economy, but also taking seriously the sort of Rawlsian critique about what happens when you have losers in a market economy. Um, but he turns it around a little bit, and he says, well, you also have to understand, uh, if you're going to have an expansive view of human potential, uh, the limits that you're going to put on uh, entrepreneurs and innovators need to be taken into that calculus, which is not something that Rawls ever did. Uh, and I think that's a useful, original way of trying to enlarge the discussion about it. Um, the, the pure sort of power politics involved, it doesn't really solve that, but um, uh, it, it begins to, I think, subtly change the, the discussion in, in, in a very helpful way. Again, it's not, that's not going to be that satisfying to you, but uh, uh, it's useful. There's some interesting ferment going on. Well, Jim's going to answer that in his own book. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, just uh, a straight comment on the issue of scale of government, which I think ties in very well to the trial and error point. You get a lot more trial and error going on uh, if you've got uh, a more decentralized uh, governance structure. And the contrast between the U.S. and Switzerland is even more stark than it might first appear because that's a very decentralized system where a lot goes on at the canton level. So they have a kind of universal health care system, but it's done canton by canton differently. And just contrast that to uh, Obamacare, where we try to write the rules for uh, one-sixth or one-seventh of the economy in one fell swoop. Um, right there. Oh, the lady. Uh, Shikha Dalmi, a Reason Foundation. Um, I'm a columnist, and one of the questions that I absolutely, or responses from readers that I hate is when they tell me, why did I write this uh, column as opposed to some other column? But I'm going to commit the same sin over here and ask you the following question, which is, uh, as I understand it, the premise of your book, or the question of your book is, why are some countries poor and some countries rich? And the answer that you give, one of the answers that you give is predatory government. Well, that's not exactly news. Essentially, that means governments that uh, societies that don't have the rule of law and accountable government, which is an institutional issue. So wouldn't it have been better to actually begin with the inquiry, why do some societies and countries evolve the rule of law and accountable government, and why some don't before studying the question of why some are poor and some are rich? Uh uh, I'll go first uh, of that one. Um, uh, it, it's a it's a perfectly good question. One thing I would say is that that I, the, the book is about certainly uh, uh, wealth disparities uh, between and among countries, but it's about a lot more than that. Uh, it what's unique about the book, I think, is that it draws together several different strands of research in different areas uh, and that have not been brought uh, together before as a, as a work of synthesis. And what we're trying to do is show similarities in, in uh, research in, in uh, economic history, uh, technology development, um, uh, uh, business and firm formation, new firm formation, and a lot of areas where scholars have been working uh, and not thinking Say I'm, say I'm working on the origin of new businesses, I'm not necessarily thinking about the disparities uh, between countries, but there's a lot of uh, research on new firm formation that's relevant to this. So I, I would just say the, the book is a work of, of synthesis. Um, the, uh, uh, and I'll, I'll leave it to Arnold uh, after that. I mean, it's, okay. I, I can't capture everything that's in it with that, but then I'll leave the rest to Arnold. Well, I guess 
I'd say that one clearly unresolved issue in the book might be phrased very crudely is, is it institutions or is it culture? Or is it government or is it culture? And, and we have people on both sides of that. I mean, on the one hand, you have Paul Romer clearly says, oh, look at, look at Hong Kong. You know, that's the same culture that you can find in other places in, in Asia and China. And look at how much better it did uh, than other places. So clearly institutions matter. Uh, and then you have people like Douglas North <coughs> and probably in the background Hayek who would say, well, no, it's kind of hard to change, uh, change a culture. So I, I think that's somewhat of an unresolved issue. In my own mind, I guess I'm a, a mostly cultural determinist with the view that institutions can change things over long periods or when they're really heavy-handed. Like, you know, communist institutions, by being so heavy-handed and so brutal, could actually overcome cultures. And so you see the difference between North and South Korea showing up in those terms. And I'd also add, this is the area where, uh, this is kind of a cop-out for an author to say this, but where a lot more needs to be done. I mean, and, and, and the people we talked to in the book, that's clearly the case. I mean, Doug North, uh, you know, is the leader of the New Institutional Economics uh, School, which he would prefer to change at this point to New Institutional Social Science. He's taking a much more expansive view of what needs to be studied to understand this question of how uh, cultures change, how societies change. And, uh, and so a lot of the work is history and a lot of the work is social science and it needs to be done uh, uh, it, for different small communities or at the national or regional level. So uh, a lot of that is where it needs to happen. I, I, I just wanted to make a comment, Brink, thanks for <coughs> inviting me in on, when, when you think about why countries are stuck and how they change over time, I mean, usually there, there are a lot of revolutions that happen including how the United States sort of got on this path. And to, to sort of tie this in with their comment earlier, trial and error, I think that's a, the right answer, and I think it's an unsatisfying answer, because I don't think it will be politically persuasive. But the US had a very federalist structure for a long time, but we've been creeping away from that. So if I were to ask a lot of thinkers around this town who I think get this concept and get this book, their solution would be the federal government needs to be more involved in giving tax credits for R&D so that we can have innovation a very centralized response. So there are people that sort of get everything that's being said, and they don't get the underpinning that, that how does real change happen? It happens with competitive units. And, and that's really the worry I have. I, I am an optimist in this sort of US versus China debate, but I'm, I, I'm still not fully bought into the optimism because I see the US creeping towards less federalism, more central control, and in a political structure that itself is an entrepreneurial. Right? You've got two parties that don't want to open up to entrepreneurial ideas. They want to maintain their, their lock. Are they going to tolerate an entrepreneurial economy? You know, I think there's a lot of momentum in our favor, but I, but I wonder about can we get to a trial and error politics again? Just to uh, add from my own thinking and researching about this uh, precise puzzle why some poor countries uh, ad adopt the institutions and policies that make them grow rich and others don't. Uh, I'm, I'm afraid that an ineradicable element is some countries are lucky. Um, if you look at poor countries that got rich uh, over the past uh, uh, half century or so, countries like uh, <clears throat> Taiwan, South Korea, Singapore, Chile, uh, they were all autocracies. Generally, autocracies are terrible for growth. Uh, but they all also had uh, communist left-wing insurgencies to deal with. Uh, so there was this strange kind of correlation of forces where on the one hand, uh, not being democratically accountable, they had distance from the kind of special interests that otherwise uh, might have uh, uh, choked growth in the crib. On the other hand, they had to worry about uh, popular uh, uh, discontent and do something to buy it off by providing uh, broader base growth. And that kind of sweet spot seemed to uh, produce pro-growth policies in those jurisdictions. How do you recreate that somewhere else? Uh, who knows? Uh, right back there. Rudolf Brillenburg, uh, Farmington Asset Management. I had uh, a, a comment and a question. Let me ask the question first. Uh, can anybody, would anybody like to comment on the future of uh, not of innovation, but of uh, of creating the organization for innovation management, if you like, uh, it, the, as as we've been talking about, there's a creeping 
so uh, making that more difficult in the United States. There's no, I don't see any other competing economy where that seems to be done any better. So I just wondered if you guys would like to talk about not where we are, but where, where you think things might develop. And just to make another comment, people don't often think of this, but another very successful country that succeeded under imperialism was Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. It's the highest uh, GDP per capita of all, of all the Latin American countries. And it, it, I, I would not make that a, an example, but I'm saying uh, there are other places where the culture is the same. Puerto Ricans are the same as the Cubans, as, as everybody else. But they had a, 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 an organization put above them that, that seemed to have worked out for them. But they're not happy about it, by the way. <laughs> but they're, they're not so unhappy to vote for full independence either. So they're, they're... You want to take a shot? Um, I think the question of future organization for entrepreneurship is too difficult for me to throw off in a two-minute answer. My one comment on Puerto Rico is that there's all, another example where you see a lot of migration, right, between Puerto Rico and the mainland U.S. And so you have to kind of control for that factor in, uh, in, in sort of seeing what, how that exception uh, played out. Uh, it, yeah, it's um, uh, the, I'm with you in not seeing um, uh, other countries right now as being uh, uh, ready to sort of uh, take the mantle of technology frontier away from the United States. Uh, I don't like the certainly most of the uh, uh, political trends at work uh, as it relates to that in this country. Um, <laughs> Uh, I know this is something that Jim Manzi's working uh, on right now. Um, uh, it's an open question. And there are a lot of, uh, obviously, spillover benefits that go to other countries because the United States is at the technology frontier. Uh, that's a part of the conversation that's largely absent from our political discourse in a really unhealthy way because it just reinforces what I think are erroneous assumptions about um, uh, where new technology and innovation actually comes from and how that can be sustained over the long haul. So, um, uh, you know, but it's, but where that will be in the future, I think is still pretty much an open question. I think we'll take one more question. Uh, this lady right here. This Deborah Cayetano from Democracy Work. Uh, there hasn't uh, been in academia and in, in law and the and in economics the the push to make money equal political power or uh, uh, legal power. There hasn't been that discussion. There hasn't been that desire. With that in mind, right throughout the history of law in the United States, the development of corporations. How do you or have you looked at the issue of legal liability when you're talking about expansion, when you're talking about designed inflation, and the effects of genocide, volatility, uh, narcotics terrorism, and this high-end enterprise that you're talking about uh, in a very side, uh, uh, what do you call it, uh, uh, a la carte way? Do you, do you address the issue of, of legal liability uh, towards genocide uh, for uh, the conditions within the third world countries for poverty, Con creating poverty with inflation, designed inflation? That, uh, that's right, really, uh, in, the, in the scope of the book. I mean, the book is about, um, uh, well, it doesn't really touch on, touch on that, I would say. Well, I think uh, with that stumper, uh, we'll, uh, <clears throat> we'll uh, call it a day. Uh, the conversation can continue uh, around uh, sandwiches for lunch. Uh, there are books available for sale. Uh, please uh, feel free to purchase uh, more than one. Uh, your friends will love them, uh, and uh, the authors will be happy to sign them. They, they make great gifts. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. <laughs>